by night, we will carry out my pledge of vengeance. The first draft of the script that I read was, you know, highly developed. He and I talked about all the characters, but he also was incredible about giving me the backstory. I think that the working relationship totally benefited from having done both The Witch and The Lighthouse with Robert. I mean, he does an incredible amount of his own research, obviously. I started to read the sagas. He would, you know, explain certain things. He would say how they fit into the characters that uh, were in the script. It's a, a fantastic primer, really, you know, for him to give me and Craig all of the information, all the actors as well. So I then sort of start off with my own research that is purely costume oriented. Uh, the materials, you know, the, the what is the beginning and then where are we going to find this stuff? You know, where, where where does it come from? The next part is to then offload all of that information to the costume department so everyone is on the same page in terms of why we are doing what we are doing. If it's not a script that you are stylizing the costumes, if it's a script and a project film where authenticity is what you want to immerse the audience in, then that becomes the first level of looking at things. And then if there are problems within you know, the performance of the piece, then you need to sort of address those as well, because people have to work in it. People you know, have to do take after take after take. Comfort was a huge thing for Alexander because He's in every single scene. He's on set basically every day in very inclement weather. He has such, the physicality is, is amazing. He's crossing wet thatched roofs. He's on uneven ground. He's in mud, he's fighting. It's just never ending the landscape changes. And so, you know, he was such a trooper. The Amoth is an interesting character because he's, we first see him as a child and he is high status. He has all the trappings of a high status boy, all the color, the excess, the precious metals, the very specific tablet weaving. All of those things take a lot of time to make and they therefore show a very high status person. And then once he leaves Hrapsi and goes to sea, the next time we see him is the adult version, which uh, is where Alexander picks up the, the story. And when we see him as a berserker initially, he is dressed in, as I say, a kind of Land of the Roos, uh, Eastern influenced clothing. We now see buttons. You know, this is something that perhaps two people in the audience might notice, but there are no buttons in Hrapsi. It, they weren't used at that period, at that place. And so now we move to Land of the Roos, which is where they were used. Then we see him as his berserker character. His is unique in that he is a combination of both wolf and bear. From there on, actually, for the rest of the film, it's kind of interesting because he is not wearing his own clothing. He is wearing either the disguise of a dead Slav man, or he's wearing slave clothing, even though he, he, he himself is highborn. He has different versions of slave clothing. We did barefoot shoes so that um, slaves would appear to be barefoot. And often Anya amazingly said, I'll just go barefoot. We then see Amleth in, in a couple of different versions of elevated slave, slave after he saves Gunnar, he becomes a slave with privileges. And then in the end, we see him as a Viking man again, but it's in stolen clothing, clothing that Olga has escaped with. And for that last outfit that we see Amleth in, the beautiful blue cloak, is actually the same hand-woven wool that his father, Orvindil, wore in the opening scenes. Orvindil's is the natural sheep color, two tones in, woven in a pattern, and we dyed that same fabric, the beautiful blue, that was the same blue of the young prince's hat. Again, these are very, very, very subtle echoes, um, helps the actors connects them. It's lovely for us in the costume department to have that those threads, you know, that, that kind of carry through. Robert loved it. The Slav costumes for Olga and all the villagers, male and female, embroidery was a huge cultural aspect to it because women embroidered the clothing for themselves and their families with motifs at the neck and the sleeves, the upper arms, the lap and the hem to ward off evil spirits, yes, but also more than that, it was a call to the gods. And so figuring out all of the motifs and where to apply them was the first kind of layer of that research. But 
If women are doing that for their own families, the Slav witch is like the Uber writer. And, and actually there's an interesting fact that I learned, which is apparently the word for embroidery at the period was the same as the word for writing. So what these women were doing is they were writing a future, praying for a future, encouraging a future. And so the Slav witch was like the Uber writer. So her costume had embroidery um, in spades. And unlike Olga and Amleth and several of the other villagers who had hand embroidered costumes in different levels of distress, we did machine embroidery for some of the Slav crowd. But then for the Slav witch, we did screened. So we took photographs of the embroidery, hand embroidery, and then screened her shift. And what was interesting about that whole process was that Jaren, who does the most beautiful uh, moonlight lighting and natural lighting in dark interiors, the moonlight lighting meant that many of the colors, red particularly, and the embroidery was meant to be in daylight, it's red or black. And then red in Jaren's moonlight lighting goes to black. So we had to come up with um, pinks and greys, which you don't really see in the moonlight, but if you were to see photographs, color photographs of Bjork in her costume, it's, you know, the, the colors are quite different. I mean, her skirt has many, many belts that are the Slav belts that are sewn together. Just beautiful barley headdress. And the cow shells and bells, which were fertility, and again, the bells to ward off evil spirits. So hers is her costume, Bjork's costume, the, the CS, is, is a kind of intense magnification of all of those cultural aspects. The challenging scenes with lighting were the warrior king, because he is literally in a dark, um, he's a mound dweller in an underground burial ship. The textile choices for that had to be very specific and, and, and quite light. So I sort of went with a vibe of ash, dust, dry, chalk, dry, light, and, and with as much kind of gold or metallic thread to throw back any light, that any available light. There was a piece of weaving, tablet weaving, in the British Museum that I saw. What the ar archeologists had found were the gold threads. Obviously the fibers had rotted. And so it was just really basically the gold in, in lines in a strip. And then they did a recreation of what they felt the actual piece of woven material with fiber and gold would have looked like. And I took a little video of that and that became my inspiration. If I can, if I can imbue the costumes in the banquet scene with that, you know, twinkle, then that will be great. I think that they're, you know, with each, with each film, the trust deepens, the friendship deepens with Robert and he loves it. You know, he, he's passionate.